to any force which our enemy may send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or, or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. It was literally three weeks later that with the cry of Je or that the shot heard around the world was fired there at Lexington. And then it was a year later that the cry of Jefferson's pen actually birthed freedom here in America. Fifty-six of them signed that Declaration of Independence. And for the first time in history, freedom was born. Now, I know, you know, the Greeks, the Romans, they made their attempts, even the British. But no one had experienced true freedom until 1776. Obviously, we were weak. It was a, a very... Uh, a docile situation. We didn't even know if we were going to have victory at that point. It would be years. We spent our infancy at war with the greatest military on the planet. It wasn't until Yorktown that we truly believed and the world believed we were going to win and ultimately through that battle really seal our victory. Again, though, we were a very young nation and freedom was uh, uh, docile at best. We didn't even take our first successful steps until 1787 with that new constitution. But then we would stumble along for another 75 years before we would experience the maturity of true freedom for all of our citizens with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Then you fast forward from that time and we became, as we said earlier, the most successful nation in the history of the world. Pretty phenomenal what has been experienced by our nation. We have literally become what Ronald Reagan used to refer to as the shining city on a hill. He was quoting Winthrop from 16 and 20. But think about that. We have actually unshackled the chains of tyranny off of people all over the world. We've defeated Nazism, communism, despotism. Uh, our success here at home has created the most incredible scientific achievements that 100 years ago couldn't even be dreamt about. It's unbelievable what this nation has accomplished. And, and, I, and I would submit to you, even now, as we have the most powerful military on the planet, second to none, that that military power of our nation has never in its history been used to conquer and subdue other people. It has always been used to free and liberate others. The only people on the face of the planet to ever make that choice. If you think about it, uh, the perfect opportunity, 1945, we're the old, only people with the bomb. But instead of taking that technological advantage and conquering our neighbors, as every people ever in the history of the world had done, we took that weapon, we used it to end a war, save millions of lives, and then we took our own money and went and rebuilt the nations that had attacked us. Something is different about our value system, our belief system. Something's different with regard to what we believe in terms of the source of freedom. We don't believe we have the right to take another person or another nation's freedom away. We think we have a responsibility uh, to export freedom as best we can. So it's quite a, a, an amazing history that we've had. But let's, let's kind of take a checkup now, because I would submit to you tonight that if you look at the health of our freedom, here in America, we've got some problems. We've got some, some injuries. We've got some infirmities. And it's, and it's mostly due to the fact that we too often have politicians that are interested in preserving their own political power. They're more interested in the next election than they are in the next generation. And they have been willing to sell the next generation for their own power. We even have people in Washington, D.C. right now in our nation that have hitched their political wagon, their future, to defeat for America. They would prefer that we are defeated so they can hold on to power over the fact that they, they what they should be doing as a patriot or a statesman would do in saying I'm willing to give up political power, I'm willing to do what's right even if it costs me an election. That type of mentality we did not see in our 230 year history. It's a very recent mentality in the political world of America today where they're selling us down the river for their own political power. But it's not just the politicians, we've got a problem, a real problem with the courts. Uh, ruling against our traditional values uh, everywhere we turn, chipping away at our religious liberties and, and other liberties, taking away the freedoms that uh, uh, 
incredible prices have been paid to secure. But it's not just the politicians or the, or the courts. It's our fault. We the people. We do not uh, remember the source of our freedom. We do not remember how this system works and, and are unwilling to participate overall in, in the process to preserve it. If you look at the statistics on the number of us that, that show up and vote, it's dismal when you think about how many get to enjoy the freedom and how few are willing to actually participate in it. So if we're going to do our part, if we're going to secure this freedom for future generations, if we're going to do our part to preserve it, then we have to look at what the true source of that freedom is and how the system works. I think one of the best quotes uh, for doing this is if you go to that, it's a, it's a quote that's used quite often, but is actually uh, inaccurately given, I think, uh, when you look at the source. Oh, I forgot I had those in there. This is kind of the, uh, uh, the shell game, I guess. I mean, too many people today... Uh, think that the real strength of America is to be found in, in things like our architectural wonders. I mean, even the terrorists get this wrong. They think the strength of, of our nation, even though that is evidence of our ingenuity and our entrepreneurship, they think that the real wealth of our nation is to be found in our materialistic belongings or, or Wall Street itself, or maybe that the strength and resolve of who we are is only in our military and the Pentagon and in our other military installations. And so that's the places uh, that they choose to attack. I would submit to you that's not the source of our freedom. If you want to find the true source of our freedom, you go to that quote of that uh, 18th century French visitor. Uh, many presidents have quoted it as de Tocqueville, but we cannot prove that in any writing, so I'm not going to say that it's his quote. But the quote is very accurate in terms of who we are. He put it this way. He said, I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America in her arbors and her ample rivers, in her fertile fields and boundless forests, in her rich mines and vast world commerce. In her public school system and institutions of learning, I sought for it in her democratic congress and in her matchless constitution. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. If she ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. The real source of our freedom, the real strength of who we are, is the recognition that our value system was based on a set of moral absolutes and based on the idea that our freedom does not come from our neighbor, it does not come from our government, but it comes from a higher source. That is what is unique about our system. And if you go to our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, and you look at those precious 56 words you find there in the heart of the Declaration, you will find the frame around the picture of your American way of life, you will find the very basis of why you and I have been able to experience unprecedented freedom. They say, they tell us there in the Declaration something very different from what the world looked like in 1776. This was the model of government everywhere on this planet. Power and freedom at that time came from God, went to a king or queen, whoever the monarch was, and then it was given to the people only as that monarch saw fit. If you lived around in 1776, that's what you experienced, and everything in your life depended upon that relationship to the king. Fifty-six courageous men gathered in that rented room we now call Independence Hall, and they said wrong. They said that is backwards. We believe power and freedom comes from God, but it goes directly to the people. And then we, the people, we give power to the government for only one reason. It's to secure the freedom that God gave us. With those 56 words, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator. Notice it doesn't say commissioner. It doesn't say state representative. It does not say governor. I guarantee you it does not say Supreme Court justice. We're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, so among us are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governor. That's the frame. Three quick points. First of all, in the frame, number one, that there are truths, right and wrong, moral absolutes. The difference here, this is not the French Revolution. Okay, the French Revolution was based on moral relativism. Anything goes, everything's okay. The American Revolution was based on moral absolutes. George Washington himself said religion and morality are indispensable supports of political prosperity. In other words, if we're going to be successful as a nation, we better have religion and morality at the very heart and basis of who we are. They believe in right and wrong. Second thing they pointed out in those 56 words is the idea that government's only power comes from you, comes from me. It means our elected officials can only do what we want them to if we're involved in the process, if we're willing to stand up and say, I give consent or I refuse consent. I mean, when you turn 18, you are empowered to influence your government and influence the future of this nation. What a privilege that we have to participate 
to be a part of the system.